So my name is Antonio Quartulli, and I'm here. I will be talking about OpenVPN. Some, some of you may wonder why OpenVPN is here at this Linux kernel conference, but this is something we'll, I will show you basically in a few slides. Um, this is my first talk at this conference. It's also the first time I joined this conference, so I think it's polite to, to give a little introduction about myself. Um, I've been open source enthusiast and developer since since a lot. Basically, I've always been doing open source development. My first kernel contribution went into Batman Advanced, if any of you know that. It's a wireless mesh routing protocol. Later, I also act a little bit the wireless stack uh, because Batman is strictly related to, to the wireless, so I sent some patches. Johannes tried to kill my patches. Some of them went in. <laughs> And eventually, six years ago, I landed into the OpenVPN world. So since six years, I've been working on the OpenVPN project, basically. Uh, just a question for the crowd. Uh, do you know OpenVPN? Raise your hand. Have you ever used it once, at least? OK. Well, good. OK. Well, <laughs> it's, been around, it's been around for a while. So yeah, so I expect some of you have seen it at least once. Do you think OpenVPN is a performance problem? Any of you does? OK, some of you do. Oh, don't be shy. I mean, I'm here actually for this specific reason. So that's the real goal of this talk. Um, so let's say something about OpenVPN. Although you know it, let me still share some words. So OpenVPN is a software that is used to create and manage OpenVPNs. It can be used to create a peer-to-peer -peer VPN, so like a simple stupid tunnel between two hosts. They will just create a tunnel that we can share data. Or it can also be configured in a client-server mode, so in a kind of star topology, where you have the server, many clients connecting, and then the server will share resources, and the clients will have access to it. Like I said, it's been around for 20 years, which can be a good thing or a bad thing, depending on how you look at it. It supports a multitude of platforms, Linux, of course, otherwise it wouldn't be here at all, <laughs> Windows, Mac OS, Android, AIX, if you know what it is, it means you are quite old, but I also do. <laughs> and several several different flavors of BSD, like FreeBSD, OpenBSD, DragonBSD, also some I even didn't know they exist. Um, it allows for various authentication methods. So if you, if you connect to an OpenVPN server, you may be asked to show certificates, X509 certificates, usual ones. Or you may also connect by uh, using credentials or username and password. But next to those, you can also have all kinds of different authentication schemas, like two-factor authentication, SAMU, and all kinds of stuff. So it's fairly flexible from this perspective. In user space, it supports linking against OpenSSL, LibreSSL, and BetTLS. Recently, also WolfSSL. So we try to keep compatibility with those these SSL libraries. It comes with so many options. Some of them may be useful. Some of them may not. It depends on your use case that some people use OpenVPN as a Swiss army knife, basically, because it can do several stuff. So actually, it goes a bit beyond just doing a VPN. Sometimes you can use it also for PMTU discovery or other stuff, actually. And this is just because there are so many options in it. Of course, there are some problematic aspects. So not everything is great, of course. And some of them are that, like I said, it's 20 years old code base. So there, are, there is some legacy code which we have to deal with. So every time we implement a new feature, every time we want to bring an improvement into OpenVPN, the effort is quite high because, like I said, the code has been there for a while. There are several options that some people still use, so we cannot get rid of them. So the bar to introduce new features is always pretty high. It's fully implemented in user space, at least until now. We'll find out later what, what's changing. And it relies on the Tune device driver. So the, the Tune device driver is just a kernel module that exposes a simple interface in, in, to the user. And then OpenVPN basically attaches to this Tune device via a socket and then exchanges data with it. And one of the worst things ever, it's single threaded. So OpenVPN runs just in a single thread. So for example, imagine the server serving a multitude of clients. One client is sending data, one client is authenticating. They are all served by the single thread. So if the authentication, for whatever reason, takes too long because it was implemented badly, for example, then all the other clients sending data will have to wait. And this is a very problematic part. Um, for what concerns performance, all in all, so if you put all these points together and we think about performance in general, we can see that at the moment OpenVPN is not performing great at all, especially because line rates are going higher and higher in, uh, in our deployments, even, even at home. I mean, now we're talking about line rates of hundreds of gigabits normally. 100 megabits normally. Uh, while OpenVPN performed well when we had the old 
ADSL with one megabit download, maybe now it's not it's not at par with what we have. So we want to improve the situation basically. So we want to to do something so that performance can be improved. However, tweaking the user space code is not as easy as we imagine. I mean, I just explained why. So just changing user space code is not something that is going to give us a big boost. So we want to solve this problem differently. And in order to solve the problem, we first have to look at where the problem really is. So let me say something else about OpenVPN. So when, we when OpenVPN establishes a connection to a server, over this connection, there are two different streams. Actually, there are, there are past. One is the control channel, and one is the data channel. I mean, like any other protocol, also OpenVPN has a control plane and a data plane. It's a fairly standard approach. And messages belonging to these different planes, they all go over the same connection. A control channel is used for authentication, for example, key exchange, parameter negotiations like the cipher or other parameters that OpenVPN exchanges at the very beginning of the connection. Once the, the control channel is established, then key are exchanged and the data channel is established as well. And here's where we exchange the real user traffic. So among these two, of course, the, the one we want to focus on in order to improve performance is the data channel, because that's where the actual user payload is being sent. Over. And the problem here is that since OpenVPN is a user space application, in order to do all its processing, traffic from the data channel has to be copied to user space and then back to kernel space in order to be, to be available to the user, basically. I have a little diagram here, which will help us to understand a little bit more. So on the right, we have the internet. We have a packet coming through. WAN zero is our WAN interface. When the packet is received, it first has to go to user space so that, OpenVP, so that OpenVPN can, can process the packet. And process the packet simply means decrypting the packet, because of course, the VPN is encrypted, possibly perform some kind of routing. And depending whether the packet is targeting this host, we will deliver to TAN0 the packet. So back to kernel space, to TAN0, and then finally to a user application. So we can see that we're doing a double copy, basically, from kernel space to user space in order to process the packet and then let it go through the normal flow. And this is what is eating us the most. So this is where the performance penalty is coming from. So here we thought about what, what can we do to improve the situation. And one thing we came up with is, why don't we move the data channel handling to kernel space? So instead of doing everything in user space, instead of doing everything in this single thread in user space, let's decouple the two channels. Let's take the data channel and move it to kernel space. And here we came up with this idea that we called OpenVPN data channel offload, or DCO for short. I will use the term DCO often in the, in the slides to refer to this new component. So in this case, the schema that we've seen before changes like this. So we don't have the processing in the user space anymore of the data traffic, because when the traffic arrives from the internet, it goes directly into this OpenVPN DCO kernel module. It gets decrypted, routing will apply, anything else that we need to do to the data traffic, and then eventually the traffic will either go out to the internet again or will be delivered to DCO zero. So as we have seen, as we can see here, we are not sending the traffic to user space and back like we were doing before. So, so we're basically moving the data channel down into the kernel. Oh, yeah. Um, there is another new thing here that we didn't see before is this Netlink socket, which is connecting user space to kernel space. And basically, that's the connection between the OpenVPN process in user space and the kernel module. Because the kernel module, the DCO kernel module, will still require some kind of configuration. Like, these are the keys to decrypt and encrypt. This is the IP of my peer. So we need some kind of communication channel. And this communication channel is Netlink in our case. So a few more words about OpenVPN DCO. So what is it exactly? It's a virtual device driver. So you can imagine it like any other virtual device driver, like VTH or any other virtual device driver we have in kernel. So basically, it exposes an interface to the user that you can see with IP link. So you'll see this new interface of a different type, of course, of a new type. And basically, inside the driver, we are implementing the handling of the, of the data channel. It performs encryption and decryption using the kernel crypto API. So we are trying to not reinventing any wheel. We have enough in the kernel, enough wheels in the kernel that we can reuse. So uh, the idea is to reuse the crypto API. At the moment, we are just supporting AES, GCM, and Chachapoli. 
However, the module is implemented in a way that can be easily extended. So if somebody comes up with a use case where we need a different algorithm, it's easy to, to extend and implement it. Like I said before, the configuration is, uh, is implemented uh, using Netlink with this new generic Netlink uh, family of VPN. Interface handling, so creating a new interface, deleting an interface was originally implemented using RTNL so that you could use IP route, so IP link, new DCO0 type of VPN, and you could create your interface. However, after some discussion on the kernel mailing list, it was pointed out that creating a DCO interface with RTNL, so with IP route, doesn't really make sense because once we have the interface standalone, we, don't, we cannot do anything for real. We still need the OpenVPN user space process to run in user space that can drive this interface. So we said, okay, let's move everything to, to Netlink. And so similarly to Wi-Fi, in Wi-Fi, you also create interfaces using Netlink and the same we do now with DCO basically. And just pointing out here that this generic Netlink approach is what's coming in version 0 0.2 and I'm currently working on it. So if you look at the patches that were sent on the net dev mailing list, you will not find this new approach yet, but we're still with the old approach. For what concerns routing, so like I said, there is still a routing component in DCO that we will explore a bit more in detail later. Um, we want to use, we are reusing basically the main routing table from the system. So we also don't want to implement a routing layer inside the kernel module, but we want to rely on what we already have in the kernel. So later we'll also explain a little bit how this actually works. And similarly to the user space program, also with DCO, we support TCP and UDP uh, transport layer. This is a characteristic of OpenVPN. OpenVPN can run over TCP or over UDP. Of course, UDP is preferred because with TCP, there is some more overhead, like it was explained by John at the very beginning during the keynote speaker, actually, the keynote speech. But the same, is still, uh, the same still applies to DCO. So in DCO, you can also use TCP or UDP. And the control channel, so we have, we've been talking about the data channel. So we're moving the data channel down to kernel space, but what happens to the, to the control channel? Well, the control channel stays in user space. So that's the whole idea. We don't want to add too much complexity to this kernel module. We don't want to bring the entire OpenVPN complexity to the kernel. We simply want to move the fast path. So the data channel, uh, the data channel processing. So all the bells and whistles, like I like to say from OpenVPN, they will still stay in user space. So all, all the authentication methods, like I said before, all the all this kind of stuff, all the kind of features that are supported by OpenVPN that are not related to the data channel, they will just stay in user space. How, how does this work? Because a little detail I haven't, I haven't yet explained is that since the control channel is in user space, user space is in charge of creating the connection. So user space creates the connection to the other peer. So imagine the client connecting to the server, establishes the connection, performs the end shake, so some parameters are exchanged, like, yeah, let's do Chachapoli, let's use this MTU. And at this point, OpenVPN user space will use Netlink to inform DCO, hey, we have a new peer now, this is the IP, this is the key you have to use for encryption and decryption, and this is the socket you have to use in order to communicate with this peer. So we actually pass the socket down to kernel space. Uh, if you want to know the details, we simply pass the file descriptor via Netlink, and then this, the DCO module will perform a, a, a socket lookup in, uh, in process context, and will basically retrieve the, the socket structure matching that particular file descriptor. So since now the socket is in kernel space, is basically owned by kernel space, how do we send the control packets back to user space for processing? Originally, we took the let's say easy approach, we have a Netlink interface, then well, let's use Netlink also for sending and receiving the control, control packets. So when DCO receives a control packet, it detects that this is not a data packet and will just forward it to user space using Netlink. The same if user space has to send the control packet out for whatever reason, then it will also use Netlink to, to pass this packet down to the kernel to DCO and then DCO will send it over the socket. This approach was okay, it just adds some more complexity because of course we have to extend the Netlink API in kernel space, we have to extend the user space program to deal with this new transport, let's say, which is not the socket anymore, but it's Netlink. So again, on the mailing list, I got some suggestion and the suggestion was why not simply ignoring the control packets arriving over the socket. And that's because user space still keeps a copy of the socket, it's not like throwing it away. So. If DCO simply ignores, I use this word for now, I explain later what it means, ignores control channel packets, these packets will simply bubble up in user space like before. 
So OpenVPN user space at this point doesn't need to be modified at all because it will simply see these new packets arriving on the socket like before. So user space can still use the socket like before for sending and receiving packets. For ignoring packets, what I mean is that basically DCO has a chance when receiving the packet to decide what to do. I will, should I process this packet or should I let it be processed by the rest of the stack? And by, by choosing the second option, basically the packet simply bubbles up. This is implemented differently for UDP and TCP. And for TCP is slightly more complex. And this is why I went for version 0 0.1 at the beginning. And the reason is that with UDP, we use the UDP tunnel in, uh, API. It's a kernel module that basically exposes a simple API for talking over a UDP socket. And with this API, you can simply say, you simply return a specific value and the stack will take this packet and bring it up to user space. With TCP, there are some more tricks that you need to apply, but it's pretty much similar. So you can still like ignore a packet and send it to upstream. Uh, sorry, not upstream, but to user space. Uh, let's have a look a little bit at the Netlink API. It's reasonably simple, I will say. It doesn't come with thousands of commands, thousands of messages, and they are divided basically in three different groups. Uh, the first group is to create and delete an interface. So like I said before, we are moving towards using Netlink for creating and deleting interfaces. So with the first two messages type, you can create an interface or delete it. The second group is for peer management. So with this set of commands, you can basically inform DCO that there is a new peer. You communicate the IP, you communicate the socket to use to talk to. Uh, you can, get, you can make, eventually communicate other parameters that are specific to that peer, like timeout, for example, or a couple of knobs that can be used by DCO. And then we have the third group, which is about key management. So after creating a peer, we have to tell DCO, hey, use this, peer, use this key to encrypt and decrypt data towards this peer. And for that specific reason, we use this new uh, these other commands. So new key, delete key, and swap keys. A swap keys is something specific to OpenVPN because, little parenthesis here, uh, when we set a key in the peer, this key cannot be used indefinitely. At some point, we have to change the key. That's, that's how it works. And I mean, there are several security reasons for doing that. So when it's time to create a new key, user space will negotiate a new key with the other endpoint. When this new key is created, is again injected in DCO as a secondary key. So like, hey, there is this new key we want to use, but don't use it yet. It's just there because we've prepared it. And when we are ready, then we call swap keys. And here, we will basically swap the secondary with the primary key. And from that moment on, the primary key becomes the, the key to be used for communication. So we have these extra commands that atomically just does this swap, basically. Something also intending to implement is that um, Whatever, whenever a process creates a new interface, we take a record of this process. And if this process disappears, we want to wipe the state and wipe the interface. And that basically goes back to what I said before, that an, an, a DCO interface without a user space program doesn't really make sense. So if there is a crash, there is anything in user space that is basically wiping out the user space process, we believe it's a good idea to just clean the state and remove the interface in kernel too. Um, yeah, this API is basically used to, to inform DCO about all the changes that we are being aware of in user space through the control channel. So whenever we have new peers, whenever we have new keys, we just use this API to synchronize with DCO, basically. So user space still keeps track of what's going on in DCO. And this is also why if the, if the user space process is killed, we cannot simply keep the interface around because it would be almost impossible to to, to continue using that interface without knowing this, the full state. So again, we went for the we are going for the easy approach of deleting the interface once the user space application is also gone. So here you can also again see how the user space program and the DCO kernel module are quite coupled together. So it's not like a standalone kernel module that you somewhat instruct and works on its own, but you still need a user space tool to be there and running. Netlink events, is uh, they're basically messages sent the other way around. So messages sent from kernel space to user space. As of now, we have basically just the Dell peer that we send up to user space. And it's simply because every now and then there could be a disruption over the socket. Imagine a TCP connection that gets disrupted. The data channel, so DCO immediately gets notified about that because it's a TCP connection. So we know that the peer is gone. And so what we do is we send a Dell peer message to user space, informing user space, hey, this peer is gone. 
do something and take care of that, basically. The peer can also disappear because of timeout. So we're not receiving data from this peer anymore. And this is only something the DCO can realize because it is monitoring the, the, the sockets. And then again, it will just notify user space. Hey, the peer is gone. We have to do, we have to do something. Uh, we can extend, of course, the messages we send to user space if we believe that there is something more interesting that DCR should tell user space. I was thinking about new, the new peer. So whenever a new peer is added by user space itself, we could still multicast a message new peer to inform any other listener on the system that the new peer has been added. It could, could be a UI, it could be anything. But yeah, this is just for saying that it's pretty easy to extend if we think there is a use case for that. Okay, uh, for concern crypto, like I said before, we are basically relying on the crypto API. So again, we're not reinventing the wheel. We're just using the crypto API provided by the kernel. And at the moment we are using the AAD crypto, crypto components. And specifically we're implementing the ESGCM and the Chachapoli algorithms. ASGCM is the recommended default choice and Chachapol is another emerging algorithm which is uh, sometimes better to use, for example, mobile phones or on constrained devices that don't have AES acceleration in hardware. So we support these two because we believe those are the main choices at the moment. And again, it can be extended if, if need be. Uh, an important peculiarity is that each peer can use its own cipher. So if the server has, has a connection with three peers, there is nothing that prevents us from using different ciphers for each peer. So one could use ASGCM, one could use Chachapoli, and the other could use one of the two again. And this is simply because the cipher and the key are a per peer attribute. So we can configure each peer with its own, with its own cipher, basically. We're concerned the transport layer, so how we send and receive packets out to the network. Like I said before, we support UDP and TCP. UDP is implemented using the UDP tunnel abstraction, which is very easy to use. So kudos to whoever to implemented that. It's quite nice. And also provide us a very easy way to, to ignore packets, like I said before. So in the handler, we simply return a special value and we say, this packet is not for us, just let it go to the rest of the stack. For TCP, uh, the implementation is somewhat similar to KTLS for whoever seen that. So basically we override the socket callbacks so that whenever there is new data over the socket, it's our callback being invoked and we bypass whoever was supposed to receive instead the data. Uh, so also because of this, ignoring packets in TCP is slightly different, but still doable. And KTLS does something similar. So I'm taking inspiration from them to implement the ignoring, ignoring packets part in TCP. Let's have a look a little bit more in details about the Rx and the Tx path. So here is, I'm explaining the Rx path. So when a packet is received from the network, we store the packet in, the, in a pointer ring. And then we have one crypto worker that is in charge of processing packets one by one. So processing means decrypting the packet, decapsulate the packet because the packet is enca encapsulated in, a, in an OpenVPN wireframe basically. And then, depending whether the packet is targeting this host or another host, we can either deliver the packet to the device, and we use NAPI in this case, or we look up the routing table and decide to send the packet somewhere else. In that case, then, yeah, we send the packet over the network. For what concerns the other direction, so the TX path is fairly similar, just mirroring, basically. So again, when we are sending packets out, when we, whenever we have packets entering the DCO interface, these packets are first queued in a pointer ring again. It's a different one. Then we have, again, the same crypt worker that will encapsulate the packet, will encrypt the packet, look up the routing table to understand where to send this packet to, and then we send the packet over the network. Uh, this is something that definitely can be improved. So at the moment, we have just one crypt. I'm basically instantiating one crypto worker that takes care of all these operations. So it's the same for encrypting and decrypting, so for sending and receiving and also for all the peers. So it's just for simplicity of the first implementation. Everything is implemented in this one worker. This is something that can definitely be improved and bring some more smart concurrency model inside. Um, let's look a little bit about the routing in details because it's slightly specific to OpenVPN because when we think about routing, we always think about we have a packet, we have to send this packet somewhere. We look up the routing table and the routing table will tell us this is the next op. This is the interface to send the packet over. Just do your stuff. Now, this happens also, of course, in the case of OpenVPN, because the DCO interface is just like any other standard interface. So the packet is received. 
We look up the routing table. The routing table will tell us, hey, send the packet to the DC O0 interface. The packet enters the DC O0 interface and gets to our module. Now, imagine we are on a server. The server at this point has several peers connected. How does the server know to which peer we have to send this packet to? Because the packet was just forwarded to DCO, but there is no information about which peer we have to send the data to. So we have this second layer of routing that we have to implement in, in OpenVPN in order to understand to which peer we have to send this packet to. And in order to do that, we have a mapping that basically maps uh, every VPN IP of our peers to the peer object that contains all the information for sending data to that specific peer. So when a packet, a packet enters the DCO interface, we will look up, we will take the destination IP, we will look up our mapping, and we will check, do we know this destination IP? Yes, which peer object is that? This one here, let's send data to this peer. This is something, however, this is a problem that exists only on the server because the server is a point, it's a start topology, so it's a point to multi-point uh, configuration. So it's the server that needs to know to which peer to send data to. However, like I said before, OpenVPN can also be configured in peer-to-peer -peer mode. And in that case, we just have one peer on the other side. So it's like a dump tunnel configuration. In this case, there is no routing because anything entering the tunnel, we just know that it has to be sent to the other side of the tunnel. There is no routing decision to be made. So this problem I'm talking about here is really specific to server mode only. However, there is a slight complication to this scenario, which is what if the packet that DCO just got is not targeting one of our peer, but is targeting a host that is behind the peer. So imagine that, imagine that the client connected to the, to the server, it's a branch office. So it's just the router of this branch office that is connected to the, to the server. And there is an entire LAN behind this client. So we need a way to, to understand how to, send, how to send this packet to the right peer in this case as well. And here the destination IP is not gonna be helpful because the destination IP is not the IP of any of our clients. Because like I said before, the destination is a client behind, it's a host behind the VPN client. So we have two options at this point. We extend our internal routing. So we reinvent part of the wheel and we implement our own routing so that we can, so that we store all this information inside DCO. And a little parenthesis, this is what happens in user space. User space has its own routing implementation. So inside user space, inside user space software, at the moment, there is a routing table exactly for this specific uh, goal. So whenever we have a, a LAN behind the client, user space has to be configured with a specific directive and needs to be informed which LAN is behind which client. With DCO, I didn't want to do the same. I didn't want to add this complexity. So I said, well, what can we do? So, well, how about we tell people, so people using DCO to simply add a more specific route in the routing table. So something like this, I have this LAN 10.18.10.10/20 and it can be reached can be reached via this specific host here, 10, 2, 3, 1, 2, 0, 3, 1. And this, get, this gateway, this next op, has, needs to be the client, the VPN client IP. So basically I'm asking the user, please configure the routing table so that you can tell me directly which one is the peer that is serving this LAN. So at this point, I don't need another routing table inside this UI. I can just use the main routing table. So what will happen is that when we receive a packet, we take the destination IP, and instead of going directly to our mapping, we first go in the main system routing table and we do a simple lookup. If the lookup comes up with an entry and this entry has a gateway like the one I shown, I'm, shine, I'm, yeah, sorry, I'm showing above, then we just take this next op and we say, okay, our destination is not the destination IP in the packet, but it's this next op we just retrieved, we just retrieved from the routing table. If no entry is found, then we assume, okay, this packet is possibly going to a, to a client directly, so we don't need to do the lookup. And then we use this resulting IP in the mapping I explained before. And then we select the peer, basically. So again, we have this second layer, second layer of routing in DCO, but we didn't re-implement it from scratch. We simply used the, routing, the, the, the main system routing table directly. And this was a great simplification, I believe, because implementing another routing layer, again, in kernel, wouldn't be really useful, I think. Another important aspect of, uh, of this DCO module is that, like I said before, it's driven by the, a Netlink API. Now, if in user space we have OpenVPN 
driving this DCO module with the Netlink API, or we have another user space program, DCO does not really care. As long as it's fed with the right information, it will just do its job. So the way DCO is implemented, it's also a way to, to allow everybody possibly to implement its own VPN. And I'm saying this because I know, I mean, my experience, even on IRC, every now and then we got reached out by people that want to use parts of, of the OpenVPN protocol, but they don't know how to interact with the, with the user space program. So with DCO, this would be simplified a bit. So basically, if you have your own VPN implementation doing some smart authentication and you lack the data channel, then you can just use DCO with, via Netlink API. So that's why I said bring your own VPN, kind of. Uh, the DCO kernel module, like I said before, is, uh, the first version has been sent to NetDev mailing list. Actually, I sent a version two already. Uh, I received some reasonable feedback, especially from a guy called Sergey. I don't think he's here, but it was very good feedback. And so now I'm working on what I called version 0 0.2 in the slides. So I'm still working on a new version. However, the current code can also be found on GitHub. So if you want to have a look, you can go on GitHub directly and look it up. If you want to use the DCO kernel module with OpenVPN 2, which is the OpenVPN everybody mostly knows, you have to use the master branch because the support for DCO is currently still under development. It's in the master branch. It works, but we're still ironing out some, yeah, some bugs here and there. The master branch will be anyway released as version 2.6, hopefully by the end of the year. So the next OpenVPN version will have DCO support. If you are a fan of embedded devices, like I am actually, there is also an OpenWRT feed I just created that allows you to install DCO and the master branch from OpenVPN too. So if you want to test DCO on, yeah, on your embedded router, or if you want to compile by yourself and run it in your own OpenWRT, you can do that by using this OpenWRT feed. Um, we also have an OpenVPN 3 Linux client. It's a new generation client from OpenVPN. It's something that's been pushed out recently. Uh, well, recently, we've been working on that since a while already. And it also supports DCO. So if any of you have seen, for example, on Fedora, you can already install via Packet Manager of OpenVPN 3 Linux client. It already comes with DCO support. So if you want to test it, you can just install the Linux client as well. Performance, uh, these are not scientific tests. I mean, I, the goal with this, te this test was more like a validation. Are we going in the right direction? Are we really gaining something by moving the data channel to, to kernel space? And the answer is yes, because as you can see from this very basic test that we perform between two virtual machines, uh, the OpenVPN case without DCO was stuck at around 700 megabit per second with DCO. So everything is exactly the same, same configuration. We didn't change anything. We simply moved the data channel to kernel space. We moved from 700 megabit to almost four gigabits, which is definitely a good result. And like I said before, we are still improving things. So I, I don't believe my implementation is perfect. Probably there are bugs and can also be improved. And so I believe we can even do a bit better than that. Uh, numbers above are just for direct for comparison. So the, the direct link between the two interface, the two VMs was 16 gigabit per second. Uh, over the GRE tunnel, so without any encryption, we are doing 4 gigabit 0.74. And with DCO, we're reaching 4 gigabit, so almost uh, the upper bound, basically. Again, this is mostly a validation test, so it doesn't, it's not supposed to be a test telling us how fast we can go. It's mostly related to, to understanding are we going the right direction or not. And likely the answer seems to be yes. Next steps, uh, I'm hoping I can get DCO merged upstream, mainly for two reasons. I like the community to be involved into this. Like I said, I'm open source enthusiast, so I like to be involved in other projects and I also like other people to be involved in my projects. So I hope this to be merged. It's actually on the NetDev mailing list, like I said. However, I will resend a new version possibly in the next few days. We want to get faster, of course, because we want to optimize as much as possible the, the code and possibly by, by maybe by improving the concurrency. This is one probably low hanging fruit because right now there is not much concurrency at all. We want to explore options for hardware or NIC offloads. This is not my field of expertise, so I really have to dig a little bit more. And if you have any feedback or suggestion, I will be, will be more than happy to listen to you. Uh, for example, I know that some cards have TLS offload or other kind of encryption offload directly in hardware. So maybe we can somewhat exploit this kind of feature as well. I, I really have to dig because the WPN protocol does not, it's not really the same as TLS. I'm, maybe this is not going to work, but yeah. 
And also, the next, in the next steps, I will focus more on embedded devices. So like I said, I'm also an OpenWRT enthusiast, so I created an OpenWRT feed to make this easy. So the next, in the next weeks, I will also focus a bit more on testing DCO on ARM-based routers. Uh, out there, there are many people running OpenVPN on small routers, especially in home labs, for example, or even in offices. So I think this is also something very interesting for, for many, actually. So it's going to... I would put some effort into that in order to understand what we can do on these specific platforms, basically. And that's it. That's it, basically. So thank you very much for your attention. Thanks for listening. I hope it wasn't. Yeah, it was pleasant. And that's it. If you have any questions, please shoot. Yeah. Questions? Uh, maybe we'll start with remote. Um, Maris May. I'll just put it on the stage. Again, he wants you to go back to slide. Can people see that? Well, I don't see it over here. I can see it here. OK, you can see it. OK. Yeah. So maybe go back to slide eight. Oh, it's OK. Or do you want to show there? Because I have to go back to slide. No, that's good, actually. This is better. Yeah, yeah. So I can read the question. Slide eight. So the question is, slide eight mentions that the main routing table is used. Is this are coded somewhere, or can it be changed, configured? This will limit policy routing, especially when balancing this route, distributing different kind of traffic over multiple VPN links. OK, right now, the main routing table, yes, it's hard coded. So we haven't changed. Yeah, this, is, this was just an easy way to, to get this implemented. So yes, the main routing table is just chosen by default. I, this is also something I thought about, because I, policy routing is something I use often in my setup. So definitely, we want to extend this feature with allowing specifying the routing table to use. But right now, in the current prototype, this is not possible. So definitely, this is a feature request that we will look into. But at the moment, the main table is are coded, yes. Thanks for the question. Related question. Um, why, why is this not using the, the name table infrastructure? Is it not coded? No. No. Yeah, just press the button. Uh -huh. Test, test. Yeah, yeah, test. Test? Ah, sorry. Uh, why is this uh, route lookup not using the existing neighbor table infrastructure and the DST entry? That would like make this much simpler, actually. OK, the, the, the easy answer is that when I started this, I wasn't aware of the neighbor table. So that was not something I had expertise in. So I just went for the easy approach, which I was familiar with, and was just looking up the routing table, the main routing table by itself. However, I'm happy to discuss more, because this is something I already got suggested. So I want to really look into this as well. Yeah, that will handle a lot of weird cases that. Yeah, then. Let's connect later, because I definitely want to learn more. Thanks. Thank you very much. I'm going to go remote again. Uh, I don't see the question, though. from Jacob Keller. He's asking, here you go. Oh. I don't know if you're familiar with this, AP, uh, with this strict policy enforcement that he's describing. Let's implement per common OK. Very good question. So the question is about, OK, you don't see the question. So the question is more, it says, more a comment than a question. Uh, when adding new gen generic Netlink API, can you double check to ensure that it uses strict enforcement of attributes and commands and implement per command policy? This helps ensure we can extend the interface cleanly. OK, so the Netlink API is something I, I re-implemented I don't know how many times, because I was also trying to go in, I was also trying to go this way. First, let me say something. So for me, the Netlink API has always been, every Netlink API I've been using in the kernel, especially the Wi-Fi one, has always been problematic because the, the understanding which attribute is used for which command, it's something you never understand immediately just by looking at the attribute description. You always have to go in the implementation, check the command handler, and say, OK, this command is using A, B, and C. So my first approach was to really create different set of attributes for each command. So I was. It was probably the, the other extreme. So each command has its own set of attributes, its own policy, its own everything, basically. So that commands couldn't be mixed up. And when I sent this version of the code to the kernel mailing list, uh, somebody complained a little bit because several attributes across different commands are pretty similar. For example, the peer ID, so the identifier of the peer, it's something that is basically used in almost every command. And having a different attribute with a similar name, but for different commands, I was told it can be very bug, bug prone, error prone, because in user space, you may use an attribute that looks similar to the one you want to use, but actually is a different one. And you end up with a mess that it's very dif difficult to debug, because Netlink is a binary 
protocol at the end. So yeah, it can be problematic. So yeah, I, I'm looking into this and if, so Jacob, Jacob, if you have any suggestion how this can be implemented in a clean way, if you have any pointer for me, like another kernel module implementing this, the way you are suggesting, I'd be more than happy so to have a look at that. Maybe let me just give a little bit clarity. So the, the point is sometimes people add attributes or things and then later on they want to extend it a little bit and it's kind of difficult because it can't be backward and both forward compatible. So this strict enforcement, if you follow that uh, policy of making it a strict enforcement, it's much easier to add extensions in the future. Okay. So I, I think you should, you should do it if you haven't. Okay. Uh, any questions from the crowd? Uh, in the first slides, you mentioned multi-threading. Is there any work going on in this direction? No, like I said, in the last slide, it's something I want to in work on. In the last on. slide as well. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, it's part of the next step. So definitely something I want to look at. I mean, it's as we know, it's not easy because once you introduce multi-threading, then there are other problems that come up. So in the first implementation, I tried to stick to something simpler because, like I said, this is more like first version that wants to show whether we're going the right direction or not. Now that we know they were going the right direction, definitely can be extended with multi-trading. Uh, I'm already thinking about that because, for, for example, the simplest way would be to just use different threads for different, for different clients, for example. There is no reason for using the same thread, the same worker for all the clients. So that would be a first blowing fruit that we can implement. So definitely there are some ideas. You're welcome to join the, the crowd if you have some ideas. Just comment on the mailing list if you want or join the IRC channel. But yeah, we want to look into that deeper. Deeper, yeah. Thank you okay. for the question. So uh, we're probably going to speed it up a little bit. There's a lot more questions online. Ooh. I don't know if you can see them, but I'll, maybe I'll just pick one. Uh, okay. Do you have a? Okay, I know I know Matis May has already been given more a question, so I'll I'll speak. I'll jump to Claudius at the very end and show that on the stage, and then uh, Matthias just send an email to to Antonio, or you can chit chat with him after. Yeah, yeah. Okay, okay so connect. take that last one as the last question. Okay, are you doing source IP validation for VPN internal IP addresses? So I guess this means uh, source IP validation. So when we receive, basically RPF, reverse path filtering, I think he's asking. So when we receive a packet from, from a client, do we check whether this client is really serving that specific IP and is not spoofing somebody else? Yes, yes, we're doing that. And again, we do the same by using the routing tables. And we, when we receive a packet from a client, we look at the source IP and we check the routing table. Is this source IP an IP we will route through this client, yes or no? If the answer is yes, then we allow the packet. If the answer is no, then we assume this client is spoofing the IP and then we reject the packet. So that's what we're doing now. Thanks for the question. Okay, I will just join the lounge maybe so other questions can yeah, be Yeah, please uh, show up on the lounge. He's going to create a table there and talk to Antonio. Thank you, Antonio. Thank you very much. Let's give it.